week's edition of the DC Life Uncensored. I'm your host, Sal Mora. I got my co host, Michael Frankel of CageMinds.com. And we're going to just jump into it. Conor McGregor, UFC 200. UFC announced after we uh, recorded the show last week that it is official. John Jones versus Daniel Cormier, two main event, UFC 200. The betting man, Conor McGregor, showed his hand. The UFC called his bluff and beat him in a game of poker. That is the combat sports world of Zufa UFC. Connor's been going crazy with his tweets, Micah. Uh, Big John McCarty put out that Connor was going to gar- get guaranteed via the conversation he had with uh, Fertitta $10 million for UFC 200. What's your thoughts on all this that's happened over the past week? I thought Conor McGregor retired a while ago. Yeah. So the, we keep talking about his Twitter account and everything he does on Twitter. He retired on Twitter. That's what he did a long time ago on Twitter. So, And then everyone got in an uproar last week that he's back on UFC 200 because he announced on Twitter. Well, we obviously know that his Twitter account lies, that he lies through that media, that he's playing a game, that... It seems to be money based. Well, money isn't a problem. Now everybody's saying he was guaranteed ten million. Guarantee me ten million. I'll take two weeks off of training with eight and a half weeks left after that, nine weeks after that to prepare for two weeks to go on a media tour, to go to California, to go to Las Vegas, to go to New York. And as all you know, recollection serves me and everything I've heard. The UFC didn't tell any of these guys you can't train for these two weeks. They just said you're gonna have to work around it. If if Claudia Gadella can do it, if Aldo can do it, if Edgar can do it, if 20-something people can do it, they're fine. If just all these title fighters can do it, well, then you're up in one of the big echelons. And hell, you're going to pay $10 million to promote this fight, Connor. Quit the whining. Quit the crying. And I, it's even more deplorable to think all the UFC fighters that were on his side. Well, maybe he, he does earn the right to not have to do so much media. Everybody for those events were there. We're not talking about extra media. We're talking about the same media all these other dudes were doing. Jones, Cormier, Edgar, Aldo. I mean, I believe even Dos Anjos and Alvarez, Joanna and Claudia. All the title fighters, all the main event fights for that week in July, they were all doing the same media. They were all working around it for 10 days, and they're all back to their regular camps now. Nine weeks out from the fight, I don't see what the problem was. Conor McGregor is an annoyance to me by now. I mean, they've announced, you're off the card, you didn't come to the media. You still keep talking about this date. Conor McGregor is obsessed with UFC 200, and if he's not obsessed, he's in love with Nate Diaz because he can't stop talking about him. He's obsessed with him. He needs to be by him and near him. He needs to have this for closure. And it's a little bit into that mentality of how these upper echelon stars of the UFC have been pushed to this breaking point. Rousey, just this weekend I heard, finally people saw her on the beach running, training. That's good for her mental. Whether she fights again or not, it's good to see her being active. McGregor lost to Joseph Duffy. I don't see him being obsessed over that loss, but now, with it hurting his ego, with it hurting his brand and his prestige in the UFC, he's become obsessed, and obsessed with this date. It's UFC 200, it's supposed to be big. Well, Dana White's already said 201, 202, 203. McGregor will fight again. He's signed to us. I'm sure he's fighting again. He opted to not retire, to not make the Aldo-Edgar fight the official featherweight title fight. So there's something sick in the head of McGregor. I don't know why he's obsessed with these dates and this fighter, but for all intended purposes, I hope that he can move on. Let's announce it. UFC 202 in October, McGregor Diaz 2, because on the same part, Diaz said the only fight he wants is McGregor. I don't understand what his appeal is for a fighter that he already beat. Is it just to take that much, to take the soul away from the UFC, to finish it off, to break McGregor so that Diaz is the biggest draw there? And then from the Diaz point of view, no other fight's big enough. I don't want Lawler. I don't want Dos Anjos. I don't want a title fight because the belt means nothing, but I thought it meant more money. And after what he's looking for is the money, right, Sal? Yeah, I mean, they show me the money, but again, it's it's. I think it's kind of good, actually, just sitting here, we're talking about it and stuff, that he's talking about UFC 200. It's going to help sell pay-per-views. And maybe he's not realizing that all the way, 
But as much as he's obsessing about it and being angry about it and hurt feelings about it, I'd be hurt feelings too if I lost $10 million. But I'd be more angry at myself for losing that $10 million because nobody else, again, like you said, everybody showed up for that media tour. You had Cain Velasquez, who's an introvert, sitting right next to his opponent, Travis Brown, and they're, they're, they're like not talking to each other. They look super awkward. The UFC puts a picture up of them too. And even DC even commented saying that if you know Ken Velasquez, you know how uncomfortable he is, but he has to do it. He has to be there. Did you hear the Daniel Cormier story about the Madison Square Garden press conference? No. He told the UFC he wasn't going to show up to the press oh, conference yeah. because his son was singing in a recital at school. The UFC said no. You will be there, and we will send people to your son's school to live stream the performance to you, but you will be here for your media obligations, and which they did do it. Cormier was extremely grateful, but the UFC said, sorry, no matter which way you want to cut it, we have to have you people here. And if they're giving McGregor millions of dollars, he has enough money to fly his whole team with him to Portugal and to Iceland, but not back to New York. I mean, you do what you want with your money, but I feel like the Fertitas would have sent a jet if you would have just said yes. Oh, I, they, they would have sent a jet for all of them. The whole The crew. whole cramp. They, they, would have, they would have probably set them up in some one of their UFC gyms, whether it be in New York, New Jersey. I'm sure there's a UFC gym out there. And, and they would have set them up there with his own camp for the days. Wherever they were hitting the tour stop, they would have had him. If he would have asked for a camp, for a gym, for, for a building, the, not just some pads, but no, if you wanted no, the, the bags, the, the cage, thing, everything, yeah. they would have done time, it. At time, I bet you they would have done it. I mean, it, it's gotten to a point, it's good and bad, like I said, but it's gotten to a point where you have uh, Fox Sports, uh, popular Fox Sports, he used to be with ESPN, Colin Coward says, uh, last week, he says, you know, McGregor's dumb, and he tells him, he goes, millionaires lose to billionaires every time. And he's talking about McGregor, because McGregor is a millionaire. But you're talking about the Fertitas, who are worth probably billions. And you're going to lose every time out. It just, just like the people that make thousands of dollars are going to lose to the guys that make the six figures. The six-figure guys are going to lose to the half million. To the mil half million is going to lose to the millionaires, and so on and so forth. It just happens. That's life. And, and again, I think his whole obsession of it... I mean, you have fighters like, like uh, Rich Franklin, former, former champion, knows what it takes, knows that he has to go on media, knows that he's even come out, and he works for one, one FC, which is a competing in Asia. It's, it's an Asian market, MMA, their largest MMA market out there. And he's even saying, and he was a former UFC champion, he's saying, you know, the UFC is basically scolding him like a child. They're teaching him, you are not bigger than the UFC. You are not bigger than Zufa. The only things that when McGregor was talking about all these media obligations, I understand when he says, I don't want to go to Connecticut and sit there with these people. Because let's, let, let's be very clear about this. Even though we keep talking about ESPN may try to take that contract that Fox had, and that'd be great. We'd both love to see that, right, Sal? Oh, yeah. But let's not forget ourselves. ESPN, if it ain't making money off of it, it don't care about nothing. You're not going to see the newest prelim added to the Ultimate Fighter 23 finale, a news article about that, on ESPN. You're only going to see the big news on ESPN. So I can't blame Conor McGregor when he's like, I don't want to go to Connecticut to do an interview with Jack and Jill on this show, who they're like, MMA, that's a lot of fun. You know, what do you do? You, there's some of those big media outlets I can understand, and we've heard it ourselves. We've been turned down for interviews from fighters who have said, you know, I'm so busy right now, I can only handle my mandatory UFC media obligations. So they do say a lot, and I can't understand that at a point for someone like him, doing Good Morning America, ESPN, Having to talk to people that have no clue what they're talking about in the industry could get tiresome. But again, doing a tour like this, where it was the hardcore writers and the hardcore fans and every stop, I've had, I have not watched a press conference that had so much fun as listening to the stuff in the crowd that was coming out in New York. That was raucous. It was, it was amazing. So I could understand some of the media talk that Connors had, but a vast majority of it was that's the party needed to argue for. I'm not willing to do anything after this. 
as long as everyone's here and we're all having the same obligations, the same radio shows, the same TV appearances, I'll do it. But it's those extra ones, the week of camp, that probably did him in last time, probably got him, you know, a little off focus or it was his own pompous arrogance. I mean, what does it say about his mentality now saying, I need to be away from the spotlight, I have to stay in the gym, and I have to do all this to be able to beat Diaz. I think he's in love with Diaz, and the funny part is he's scared of Frankie Edgar, because why has that name never come out of his mouth? Yeah, well, you know, it's 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 mind-boggling to me. I mean, either do 55 or 45. If you're not going to go down to 45 to, to uh, defend your title, go up to 55. And he says let, he's going to come in to UFC next time. Slim, lean, and trim. He's going to be fighting Diaz at, at 170, probably walking in at 60 or something, because he says he needs to feel lighter, be faster. He's already scared of the bigger man. I've never heard Nate Diaz called that by anybody. I understand he's three inches taller, but are they really that far apart, do you think, in size? Uh, taller, taller-wise, but no, I don't, I don't think so. I, uh, Nate is, is a 155-er, so... You know, who who jumps to 170 just like Cowboy Cerrone does? Uh, no different there. But, yeah, no, it's it's not that much of a big difference. Conor uh, McGregor is so great. You think about him talking about, I'm taking on such a challenge, a bigger man. I'm moving up a weight class. I need to have the time to prepare for that. Now he's saying all that. It wasn't a big deal when he was fighting Dos Anjos. And let's think about for Frankie Edgar, it was never a big deal. The dude that's my size, 5'6", walking around in 155, fighting those dudes. I mean, some of McGregor's excuses, I feel, are getting dried up, lame, tired out, and could be disproven by guys that we see walk around, take fights up weight class. Cerrone could care less. Edgar could care less. Some of these dudes, all right, call me. I'll do it. Uh, RDA, refresh my memory, but didn't didn't he beat, beat Nate Diaz? He beat down Nate Diaz. RDA hits hard. He has a good wrestling game, and he's slick, as slick on the ground with his jiu-jitsu as Diaz. Diaz doesn't oh. want a title fight because he wants no part of a guy that can hold him down and pound his face in. And wasn't that at 155? At 155. Yeah, you're, and you can't beat him at 170 on, what, two weeks' notice? On two weeks' notice, and you said it was going to be no thing, easy. But I still do hold that with the right game plan, a game plan Esque and centric fight. A lighter, faster Conor McGregor can run around and pick apart Diaz with the leg kicks for a longer period of time, cut down his movement, and possibly beat him. Uh, it's a theory. If he's you look gonna, at the way Josh Thompson get taken did it, down, and then he's gonna he's gonna get held down because again he's the bigger man and he he actually has a grappling background. And if you have that grappling background that Nate does, you're strong to, to hang on to somebody, especially a non-grappler in McGregor, because McGregor's not a grappler. And, and it's going to be more of the same. He's going he's gonna to take him down, choke him out. I would suspect the second out. fight to last longer because I think McGregor comes in quicker, stays away from the stand-up, and it would take Diaz probably till about the point where he submitted Connor in the second round in the first fight for in the second fight to get annoyed with McGregor running for him before he shoots a takedown because Diaz is going to work his boxing, I think, until he's really pissed off. He wants to touch his face up for a while. Possibly. I mean, the fight can happen in New York, especially they're saying, hey, Ronda's going to be fighting on that card. That would be a huge card. Let's, let, let's forget about 200. 200 is going to be good regardless. It's 200. It's a historic event. It's a decent card. People are knocking the card, and let's really take a look at this. If you look at just the main card, we're talking about three five-round fights. Jones, Cormier, too. That's interesting. Aldo, Edgar, too. I'm still excited about that. Yes, there's Nunes and Tate, and you never know how that could play off because they hit the ground. Nunes is a better submission artist, and their stand-up is a lot to be desired from both of them. So we never know how that could play out. And then you still got Hendricks Gastelum and I believe the way it's looking, Velasquez Brown on that main card. So we got two former champions and three title fights. Yeah. Are we really hating on this card? And, and that's that's what I don't get why people are even saying it's a bad card. Like now, the Brazil card, the UFC, what is it, 198? 198, I want that's, to marry that card. That's, uh, that, that could be 200 all on its own. But, but it's still, they're, they're comparable to each other, you know? And it's just it's just wild to me that people are complaining about it. Uh, what do you think of what they're doing right now lately? Switching topics. 
the women's division in the UFC. We're talking about Cyborg coming in at 140 pound catch weight. And if you didn't see earlier this weekend, they announced the first 125 pound UFC women's fight where Joanne Calderwood is going to meet former strawweight title challenger Valerie Letourneau. This is just a test run. It does not mean that we're going to have a flyweight, women's flyweight division yet in the UFC, but it is a test and a step in that direction. What do you think of what they're doing branching out with weight classes now in the UFC for the women's out? Who, who has 140 pound uh, division? The, the there women? is no, no 140 pound, or 45. 145. Who, who um, does? Featherweight is with Invicta and with Bellator. Okay, and then who else has a 125 pound division? Right now, officially, yeah, officially, only Invicta. Uh, doesn't you uh, Bellator as well? Bellator has announced that they will have that division, okay. but I don't know if they've had more than one or two fights. They've really moved forward with their 45-pound division. Marlis Kuhn and Julia Budd, we're waiting for that title fight soon. But as far as the flyweights go, they've said they're going to do it, but they haven't really made that giant push like they've done at featherweight. They've even had a couple strawweight fights more than flyweight in Bellator. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I believe, and then you, you just mentioned Bellator just signed another guy. That's coming off of UFC? Uh, there was Sergey Karatanov, and then also, um, who was the most recent pickup from Bellator? But, but they're, they're picking up guys. You know what they I mean? are they're steadily starting to picking them up. They're, they're, they're picking apart. They're starting, it's starting to remind me of the way Strike Force was going. You know, they're starting to get them, picking them slowly, and, and they're doing it. I think they're doing it the right way. I think this is what's affecting the UFC into having to do the 25 division. You know, you got girls that are not big enough for a 135, but not small enough for the 115. Yeah, you know, and you're seeing a lot of the 105ers. I mean, we had Jody on, i.e. Jo Jody Escobel. And she's, she's moving up. up. She moved up to 115. Now, granted, she walks around around 130, 140. But for her to cut to 15 is no problem. To her to cut to 105, where she was fighting in, was hard. was hard. So now you're seeing the girls that are having a hard time making 105 move up to 115. And this is all, I think this all has to do with the U, USADA, uh, the, the IV bands. Because now you're, you, these guys can't cut balls to the wall. These girls can't cut all the way down and then do it rehydrate as fast so i think it's affecting everything i think it's not just one thing or the other i think i think it's it's all playing a part it's talking be about that weight cutting issue i also saw that california is coming up with some specifics of their own yeah. and that could make ufc 199 very interesting uriah faber he says he cuts himself to death to make 135 he doesn't know if it'll be a problem same thing goes for our middleweight title fight will luke rockhold be able to fight in his home state or not because he cuts a massive amount of weight and it's yet to be determined if they'll end up being considered dehydrated and then medically not clear to fight by the commission it can it can mess up some fights it's a very interesting time in mixed martial arts for sure uh this past weekend uh, Andre Berto and and uh, Victor Ortiz. Victor Ortiz fought each other. Rematch. It, it was a rematch, and uh, Andre Berto won, got redemption in, in the fight. And uh, after the fight, though, the crowd decided to throw. It looked like almost like a foam ice chest. At Victor Ortiz because he lost. It looked like, I guess, I assume. A member of the crowd launched, launched uh, some kind of object at Victor Ortiz and his entourage as they were exiting the ring. You can see the video up a bloody elbow. They do have it. But that would just be one of the horrors. Like the UFC, they like that fan interaction. They have their walkway so thin where the... Where I remember the great YouTube video, look up fighters' hats getting stolen on the way to the octagon. Yeah. That one's great. There is that point where the crowd is too close. And this was just a bad look out there at the StubHub Center in California. And being that and it's dangerous. on Fox. It's, and it's, it's on Fox. It, it wasn't on Fox Sports. It was on Fox. Big Fox. Yeah, so it was interesting. But you know what? The, the best thing about this to me in combat sports was it hit one point. Five one million viewers. Now people say, "Oh, well, the UFC hits that. UFC does this." Well, the UFC won't do those numbers. I don't believe against uh, NBA basketball playoffs. It's in the heart of NBA basketball playoffs, and they hit that number. 
that shows me boxing is not dead. It's still around. It's There's a reason why it's the oldest combat sport here in the United States. You know, hand-to-hand and most popular one. And it's it's wild to think. It's great to see boxing do those numbers. And I'm going to give you guys a spoiler. I did not watch the fight. Sal, did you even know there was a fight on Fox? I knew there was, and then I completely spaced it because, again, I was watching the NBA playoffs sitting there, and I didn't, I didn't even realize that there was the fight. I just don't know if boxing puts out the promotional media the way that MMA does to get the hype up. Uh, I just... I'm more surprised about the numbers also because we talk about the UFC craving and dying for stars. Who the heck is Andre Berto except for some guy that lost to Floyd Mayweather? Who is Victor Ortiz besides he was a former world champion, but he's had such a lackluster chin in the most recent times that he doesn't really pull off that star appeal. So that would be the bigger part about this numbers. Nobody that a you know casual fan would care about, I believe, was on that card. So that's an even more remarkable number. I can see where you say casual fan. Hardcore fans, I understand they, they would know, know who Andre Barto and, and Victor Ortiz are. I'm calling a casual fan because I'm a casual fan of boxing. I rank it down as my least favorite combat sport. But sure, um, I just did not really know that that was that big of a fight. Didn't know it was coming up. And for it to pull those numbers, congratulations for them. Floyd Mayweather also is dropping hints, not only on Showtime, he promoted a card on Showtime, uh, it, it, that card I don't really know anything about, the whole point is, and then he applied for trademarks for 50, so TMT, the money team, 50, he applied for those, uh, different, different, and of course, how many fights does he have? 49. And what's TBE would stand for? TBE, the best ever, 50. Oh, okay. You know, so so he's doing all of those different uh, different trademarks. He's applying for them. He's being a businessman because that's what he's going to sell. He's going to sell T-shirts. He's going to sell hats. He's going to make sure that his trademark is there. He's going to make sure people can sell it. This guy is pretty smart. He gets money off of hot dogs and drinks at concession. Not only does he get it in boxing. I mean, not only does he get the pay-per-view numbers behind it. It's wild because he has a deal with MGM Grand and the casinos and stuff like that. So a lot of people don't realize that. Casual fans don't realize that. Like every hot dog you buy while you're watching his fight inside that, that arena, guess what? He's getting a piece. Whether it's a penny, two pennies, five cents, whatever it is, he's still getting that piece. Real quick, my problem with Floyd McGregor and Conor Mayweather, they've both thrown out a word that when you – how many people have you told that you love in your life, Sal? Not many, right? Not too, too many. Well, fighters love the fight. They love the sport. That is their number one in most of their lives. So much that guys retire and come back all the time. Well, for these two arrogant fools to just be throwing that word retirement around, like for some of these fighters, that is the end. It is an emotional moment. And for these guys to throw it out as negotiation ploys, it it literally makes me sick. Mayweather's coming back, but... Does anybody really care? I mean, it would have to be a big fight, and I don't see him taking on a, a guy that I'd recognize. I've heard Kell Brook uh, name come up. I'd have to check him out. He's 36-0. and 0. Maybe Mayweather puts on a good show, but I, I've never bought a Mayweather pay-per-view. I'm not going to start now. I predict that he'll win his 50th fight right now, right here, by decision. I don't care who he's fighting. Number 50, by decision, like the last 10 have been. I haven't been wrong on a Mayweather prediction, and I've never watched more than two minutes of tape on the guy. He's the best boxer out there. Pure boxing, boxing. I didn't say fighting, boxing. Boxing-wise, defensive boxing, I mean, this guy can see things coming at him that no other boxer can. He can force you to move certain ways in there. And I really believe if he, if, if whether Manny has a bum shoulder or not, he beats Manny 10 times out of 10. Uh, like I said, I'll always take Mayweather by decision. Just too much smarts up here. Boxing smarts. Not not anything uh, else. Businessman. Businessman, true businessman. Congratulations on all the money. I've just never heard in any of those 12-round decisions anybody come up with a good dynamic reason why this was something 
I could not miss. Right. Why it was such a big spectacle. I've never got that about Mayweather. I understand he's coming back. It's going to be huge for some people. He's going to win his 50th. Tell me when he fights Triple G because that's the only one people say could give him a problem. He'll probably dance around him. Well, Triple G gets off balance trying to throw big shots. But if it's the one guy he doesn't want to fight, that's the guy that I want to see him fight because Pacquiao sounded fun until it happened. And I think it would be more of the same even with Triple G. I think he's too smart for him. I think that the and, and they say uh, Triple G is is uh, he's trained by a Mexican a Mexican trainer who trains him in a Mexican style of fighting, which is head down, chin, chin down, and just let's throw and, and let's knock this guy out. Well, those those kind of guys are tailor made for for Floyd Mayweather when you do that plotting forward bullshit. That, that they do, and it's a, it works for some, but it doesn't work for all, and, and I just don't, I don't see it happening, I, I think, I think he could tag him a few times, but I still don't think, I think that would be easy work, I think he's, I think he's saying the truth when he's saying, you know, G, Triple G would be an easy night. The only reason why I don't know about people that say things like that is if it's such an easy night, why not take the money and do it? Well, it may be happening. It may be happening. Maybe that'll be the first time I watch Flame Mayweather fight. Maybe that will be interesting, or maybe not. I I've just never got the. You Let, know. Let's let's not say the R word. Let's say the V word. And what I mean, let's not say the retirement word. Fighters, let's say I'm going vacation. on vacation. That's all he did was a vacation. He's coming back. All good. Let's see how it feels. Tough. Talk about another guy that's going on vacation. Tough fourteen winner. Diego Brandao lasted all of what two weeks in New Mexico. I think it was like a month. We'll give him some credit. Okay, we'll call it, we'll call it a month. Uh, first time out, you know, he he lasted a while and then he got into some trouble. From what I was hearing, uh, left, went to Brazil, went, went to Houston went for a went while. To Houston went went to Vegas, I think, and then went back home. Stood home for a while. Uh, got here, looked good, looked like he seemed was to be focused. He seemed to be refocused again. And uh, and then shit happens. Diego Brandao went out, went to the clubs downtown, and then we end up, by the end of the night, we have one count of aggravated battery, three counts of aggravated assault. It seems that Diego Brandao was kicked out of knockouts, a strip club downtown, and that he tried to re-enter, was unallowed, then later came back, and this is all, again, speculative towards the stories that we've read. None of these are facts. Came back with the weapon, apparently a handgun, and hit a couple people with that thing. Well, Diego's now obviously arrested. Uh, obviously, you know how bad it can look on a fighter? Well, you know this. When it looks bad, the fighter gets released from the UFC. John Jones walked away unscathed. He was not released. Travis Brown, after investigation domestic violence, it obviously didn't you know, lead to any conviction. He was cool with the UFC. I don't Anthony even think he Johnson. Was charged. Anthony Johnson also had domestic violence rumors that was investigated into. But, he's been but cool. Never charged either. Diego Brandao has been charged. released. Prison time looks to be in the future Possibly. because that is a big one. Yeah. And it is sad to see that someone could not handle going out the maturity of a nightlife. We know that Albuquerque can become Alba crazy. But you got too much to lose in a scenario like that to not be mature and heady. I think L.A., I think Dallas, I think Vegas. New York, Vegas, anywhere, Phoenix, anywhere can become a crazy night out. It's the person that chooses this. It's not the city. It's not anything else. It's the person that chooses the right from wrong. Uh, just like I always say, John Jones is John Jones' biggest opponent. Diego Brandao is Diego Brandao's uh, shortcomings. And then also this weekend, there was some other news that was towards the MMA scene. I don't know if you've seen this one, Sal, out in California. Big LeVar Johnson, a former heavyweight of Strike Force, the UFC, and Bellator. Domestic violence charge, beating his girlfriend. He has been convicted and will serve five years in prison. Wow. And, and I also point this out because I had to say this on Twitter. It was funny because I found this on several articles. UFC fighter going to jail. UFC fighter going to prison. It's funny it's how it's clickbait. It's funny how no one ever mentions he was a strike force fighter first and a Bellator fighter most recently. But Bellator fighter going to jail, people would just figure it's another war machine story, I guess. But when you put UFC fighter, that plays it. And I feel that they took a little unselfish beating there because really the dude was a vet of everywhere. Yeah, uh, it's it's sad to see. I, I'm surprised 
uh, did he put her put her down pretty hard or that's that's according five, to the story five years, five years. you know it, regardless you shouldn't be touching females and that's something a lot of people struggle with and and i always i got two boys and i got a little girl and i strive to tell them daily don't even pretend like you're picking up your fist to your sister don't ever pretend to even be throwing blows with any girls there, it's not worth it. Don't do it. I try and put that in their mindset since now that they're little boys all the way up till they're adults. So, it, you know, uh, consistency creates a habit. They're consistent with that. They'll, they'll be habited with not ever putting a hand on a female. That's the hope anyways. You never know what happens in life and, and with people. And changing gears a little bit, I bring up he's a former Bellator fighter. I got a couple Bellator things to drop on you guys real quick. Well... Josh Thompson, Michael Chandler, I was looking forward to it next weekend. It's not happening. Uh, an unidentified injury, Josh Thompson has to pull out. That fight's going to be delayed. Also for Bellator 154, injury news, we got to send our thoughts and prayers, and we hope all of you do the same out to Jordan Parsons. He's a member of the Black Zillions, 11-2, 145-pound featherweight. He was scheduled to be on that main card also, but that will be unable to happen Sunday morning early, he was walking home, a hit-and-run accident, and Mr. Parsons has had, according to MMAFighting.com, a part of his lower right leg amputated. And from a Instagram message from Rashad Evans, it is apparent now that Parsons is in a coma. So our thoughts and prayers, obviously, to him. As far as the car goes, it must go on. Uh, two new fights added to Bellator 154 heavyweights: Josh Applett taking on Sergey Karatanov and Andre Filio versus Rick Ringer. So that's a veteran heavyweight matchup and a welterweight matchup of two young, talented, uh, highly touted prospects. So again, big part of that: Jordan Parsons' thoughts and prayers go out to him, hoping that he can recover and you know get some sense of his life back. Absolutely. Uh, we got to take a quick commercial break. When we come back, we're going to be talking to King of the Cage and head Brazilian jiu-jitsu coach, uh, gi jiu-jitsu coach, I should say, at Fit NHB, Steve Hanna. Steve Hanna, when we come back, he's talking about King of the Cage Resilient, which will take place more f- May 14th, Ute Mountain Casino, when we come back. ISP, that's International Strategic Partners. When you think protection in New Mexico, you should think ISP, not your everyday security company. Offering background checks, self-defense courses, handgun, firearm, licensing, and a plethora of security patrol and investigation options. Call us at 505-255-6063. That's 505-255-6063. 6063 or online at callisp.com. The Fight Shop New Mexico in the Montano Plaza Shopping Center, located off Coors and Montano. We're back on the DC Life Uncensored. Right now, got to welcome in our guest, Steve Hanna, Fit NHB. He's going to be in the main event of King of the Cage Resilient. Steve, thank you for the time. How are you feeling, sir? I'm feeling good. Thanks for having me, guys. First off, you're getting a main event showcase back up in your home neck of the woods, up in Colorado. So what was the excitement like when you got told that's where you're going to be placed in the card, main event spot? Uh, very, very excited. I'm really happy to be able to put on a show in front of my hometown fans. And hopefully all the people that have been following me for a long time now will get a chance to come out and have a fun night and watch me fight. Last year, you made the move from Durango down to Albuquerque. Becoming a member of Fit and HB, that transitioned into only one fight last year with the change and everything, but it was a TKO win. So how did you surmise how your 2015 went? I thought it went really good. I, like I said, I'd like to have been a little bit busier, but that's just sort of the way it plays out. So I really can't complain. I, I learned a lot. I improved a lot. Got some good experience and got a good fight in. 
And now, having been down here for a while, really acclimated yourself to the team, what has it done for you as a martial artist, that transition coming down to fit in HB? Uh, it's, it's really forced me to grow a lot. You know, it's really forced me to uh, improve in areas where I, I feel like I wasn't up to par before and really grow and expand my game a whole lot. Do you feel that it's been since January since you fought, so we're going on 15 months or so. Do you feel that there's any cage rust? Um, I don't think so. I actually fought in October. And it is not up to date. (laughs) Um, And I imagine maybe a little bit in the first round I'll have to shake off a few cobwebs, but... We train so hard and so often, I'm really not too concerned about it. I think I'm going to get in and feel good. Having that momentum, back-to-back victories, what does that feel like now, getting on a momentum, getting on a roll? Um, It feels good. I just want to stay busy. I just like fighting, win, lose, whatever. I'm just happy to be in there and, and be doing what I love for a living. Come May 14th, opposite of you, Joe Miles, what do you know about him? Uh, I know that he's pretty good everywhere. Um, I think he'll be a tough fight. I think it'll be an exciting fight. So I'm just looking forward to that. I think I'm going to be able to put on a really good show and entertain a lot of people. So knowing that, do you feel that there's one area of this fight where you're going to be able to dominate? I always think I have the advantage uh, jiu-jitsu-wise. I, honestly, I think I'm going to be able to have an advantage everywhere. But I always think I have the advantage with jiu-jitsu. You've been working in your ground game for so long, so when you think you have that advantage striking, does it almost become tempting to want to put those hands to use, get more well-rounded, and get that live time of using your hands? Oh, absolutely. There's, uh, there's not many feelings that are better than punching someone in the face, so it's pretty addicting once you start getting good at it. <laughs> Talking about all the time you've spent on the ground now since you've been out here, you've had a lot of time to get your program going. What has that been like for you, your gi program at Fit and HB? It's been really good. You know, it started out really small. It's steadily growing. I've got a pretty good-sized program going now. i got a lot of really good, consistent students, so I only see bright things for the future of the program here. And has that ever been a taken aback moment to think about how much you're still growing as a fighter, but then also molding these minds on the mat yourself? Oh, totally. It's, it's something I reflect on quite often. It's a, it's a pretty cool experience. It's very rewarding to be a coach and to see my students grow. And then at the same time, it's very rewarding to watch myself grow. So it's, overall, it's been a really good experience. And then I believe coming up here locally, there is a grappling tournament coming up soon. You guys, uh, the Fit and HB gym, this weekend was trying to raise money. Do you know how that turned out? Um, I don't know that we met our goal exactly, but I do know that we raised quite a bit, and we're going to be sending quite a few competitors over, so we should have a pretty good turnout, and I expect that everyone from the gym will do really well. Then we know there's things like Southwest Gra- uh, Grapple Fest. There's Naga coming out here. We know that you love doing the jiu-jitsu. Are you getting into the uh, back end of participating and competing yourself here? Uh, possibly. I won't be doing Naga this weekend. Naga this weekend, just because it's a little close to my fight, I'm not going to risk getting an injury or, or doing something silly that close out from my fight. But uh, in the near future, it's something that I, I'll definitely consider being more involved with it's something i enjoy doing so in particular if there's a money division i'll always go try to win some money and then something big that we were talking about here on the show last week was ebi were you able to take a watch on that i missed the last one i saw the one before it but i missed the last one so what do you think of their format the submission only their way of doing overtime in comparison to the ibjjf kind of way they do it I absolutely like it better than IBJJF. Uh, IBJJF is probably my least favorite rule set for grappling. I really think they are watering down jiu-jitsu way too much, and I don't like that they're disallowing all the coolest things. You can't neck crank, you can't foot lock. Uh, I think that's silly. Uh, to me, grappling is grappling. One submission is not dirtier than any other submission. They're all just submissions. 
you don't tap to any of them, they all hurt you. So I, I think it's a little silly to to get rid of those. So I like the Eddie Bravo rule set, and I enjoy it. I think it's a an entertaining spectacle to watch. So given the opportunity to compete in a, a, a competition or a tournament like that, say you didn't have an MMA fight coming up, something that you would jump at that opportunity? Oh, yeah. I'll do anything if the pay is right. <laughs> anything if the pay is right. <laughs> Being a fighter, going out there, taking things on days notice, stuff like that. Do you think about you know what could come when you say, "Oh, I'll, I'll fight anything," doing anything like that? The crazy things a promoter could come at you with. You know, it's I I said it and I meant it. If the price is right, I'll do it. <laughs> if the price is right, wow. Well, that just feels like you know a bad day game show, which you carry on it right now. <laughs> <laughs> and then this weekend also coming up, we got Battlegrounds. Uh, what have you seen also differently with Finn and HB from other gyms, other places you've learned at? I mean, because they'll have the in-house grappling tournaments, the Battlegrounds. There's a lot that goes in with the team, the bake sales. What have you thought of the whole atmosphere and the way they handle everything with the team and also putting on all these events? I think it's a really good thing. I think it's a great venue for uh, younger, less experienced fighters to start developing themselves in the ring, getting that exposure, getting that experience competing in front of people. That's something I never really had coming up, um, and it's something that I would have liked to have had, so I think it's really beneficial for everybody that's up and coming around here. Coming up for King of the Cage Resilient, right there next to you on the poster is Amanda Lovato. Do you know in total how many team members you have on the card? I believe... Just two of us, myself and Amanda Lovato, and then a couple of my former teammates who are still my close friends. I still go up and train with them on occasion and stuff. Will also be on the card, like uh, Kevin Worth, for example. Ute Mountain Casino. It's coming up this weekend. What would a three-fight win streak? Well, next weekend. What would a three-fight win streak mean to you, uh, Steve? Um, I don't think too far ahead. I, I'm just focusing on winning this one. I, I like winning, so I, I really hate losing. I definitely want to win. Ideally, I'll be able to put on a good show and uh, showcase some skills and maybe get noticed for some bigger money fights here coming up. And then, last thing, who'd you need a shout-out to and who'd you need to thank, sir? I want to send a thanks to Damage Control for sponsoring the New Mexico Wild Bunch, our team. Uh, they're our number one big sponsor right now. I also want to thank uh, Chris Jones for sending me a little care package, helping me out, always having my back and believing in me. And besides that, I just want to thank the whole Wild Bunch and everybody at FitNHB. Everybody, we're talking, if you're in northern New Mexico, southern Colorado, Ute Mountain Casino, May 14th, King of the Cage presents Resilient. And if you don't catch it then, we're sure Mav TV will have it later on for, for you guys. Again, Steve, thank you for the time. DC Life Uncensored will be back after these messages. Thanks for having me, guys. The Fight Shop New Mexico in the Montano Plaza Shopping Center, located off Coors and Montano. ISP, that's International Strategic Partners. When you think protection in New Mexico, you should think ISP, not your everyday security company. Offering background checks, self-defense courses, handgun, firearm, licensing, and a plethora of security patrol and investigation options. Call us at 505 255 Six zero six three. That's five zero five two five five six zero six three. Or online at callisp.com. All right, we're back. This is the DC Life Uncensored. I'm Salmora Mike Frankel. A great interview with Steve Hanna out of Fit NHB. He's the head gi jiu jitsu coach there. He's going to be fighting next week, King of the Cage, in Ute Mountain Casino. It's southern Colorado. It's like literally on the border of of New Mexico, Colorado. It's a nice little venue, great show. They always get packed out. It's 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 going to be an exciting time for him. Good luck to him as well. Right now, before we go 
we have to do the cageminds.com local scene. Micah, fill us in on everything local. Well, locally, this past weekend, Pueblo, Colorado was the place to be. You had Rocky Mountain Rubicon 2, Jackson Wink Academy. They are up there in full force. Andrew Tennyson was up in the main event. RFA lost to Corey Sanhagen by decision. Gets back in the win column. TKO, I believe it's the first one of Andrew's career professionally. TKO victory over Adam Martinez. You also had the groovy one, Landon Venata. No more featherweight for him. Can't make the weight. Back at lightweight, 8-0. Rico Blackman got laid out. Two minutes, six seconds of the first round. A knockout. You had some great action from them. Stephen V. Hill with the first round. TKO, another member of the Jackson Wink team. They went up there and held business. All your Rocky Mountain Rubicon 2 results, you can find those at cageminds.com. Not really for the local scene, but I'll throw in this little tidbit. You also got your Titan FC 38 results that you can get up at cagemines.com. Balil Muhammad put it on. Tough veteran, Bellator veteran, former WSOF title holder. Steve Carl, I mean a beatdown of striking over five rounds or uh, four rounds in the fourth, getting the TKO stoppage. Benil, Steve Carl a veteran who may be on the way out. We also got to talk about locally June 25th, Jackson's MMA series. Added newly, Mike Justice, Harvey Park. That is a professional lightweight bout. Also, I know that you can go look at their webpage. We have an amateur bout also added, Tal Pleasant from Tua Pleasant from the Albuquerque Brazilian Jiu Jitsu Academy. He'll be getting back in action. And we got, like we said, May 14th, a lot of action going on where you're going to have UFC 198, Bellator 154, King of the Cage Resilient at the Ute Mountain Casino. And we also got the showdown up at Buffalo Thunder Resort and Casino. We're talking about Holmes Boxing. You go to cageminds.com. Terry Taylor joined us for an interview Terry going to be after having an amateur run in boxing, two pro fights about five years ago back in MMA, making his pro boxing debut. We also had news last week that joining the card, Alex Holguin would be fighting Ivan Lucero. Right now, as the card stands, Lucas Gala, Omar Bearfield, Terry Taylor, Aaron Martinez, Brian McLean, Daniel Garcia... Alex Holguin, Ivan Lucero, Antonio Tomartinez with an opponent to be named, and Brandon Holmes. That's what you're looking forward to heading up to Buffalo Thunder. And don't forget, also, you could go down, same night, Chaos and Clovis, Elijo Senna in the main event there. A lot of boxing going on. That was for you on May 14th. Don't for, uh, May 14th. Don't forget that next weekend you're going to have Josh Torres and are you going to have on the 20th Fidel Maldonado in action on the 25th that we've been talking about of June you have Josh Torres in action and we also have for the local audience to talk about again Aztec Warfare June 11th not confirmed yet but I believe making his boxing Debut, Oliver Parker from Fit and HB will be taking on Jose Luis Sanchez. You have Hector Munoz, Rolujo Castanda. You have Jesus Pacheco, Ricardo Garcia, and names like undefeated Angelo Leo, Jason Sanchez, Alex Holguin, if he's unscathed from the showdown, is supposed to be in action. Jose Osario, June 11th, boxing back in Albuquerque. Been a couple months, and that would be at the Hispanic Cultural Center. So a lot coming up locally, and we still got June 10th, I believe it's going to be, and August 25th, King of the Cage with the King of the Cage with their summer series coming with two events locally. There is a lot of action going around. Jackson's MMA series, King of the Cage, Legacy Boxing, Holmes Boxing, a wild hot summer of action coming towards us. All this information was again brought to you by our great sponsors. We've got to thank International Strategic Partners at callisp.com. We've got to bring Sal back in and see if I missed anything else. 
I think you touched on everything. If you did miss anything, go to cageminds.com. You can get all the information, both local and national there, cageminds.com. Anything else you'd like to say before we go? I think there's Grapple Fest, uh, Anaga coming up, right? May 7th, this Saturday. Ha, there, that's what I missed. Naga, get out this weekend. There you go. This is DC Life Uncensored. We record live every week inside the Fight Shop New Mexico at 6200 Coors Boulevard Northwest, Suite A4. Make sure you stop by, check it out. If you're in Albuquerque, we're on Coors and Montano. That's it for this week's edition of the DC Life. Check it out every week, cageminds.com.